bias as a trim. Using bias strips in various ways, one makes very effective design features. The loop buttonhole made with very narrow strips of bias. These strips are called spaghetti. Bias strips gathered become very pretty ruffles. A single fold bias strip becomes a barrel cuff. A stitched bias strip becomes a tie for the waistline of a garment. A double fold piece of bias called piping is a very neat finish for the bottom of a sleeve, also a neckline, and once more spaghetti straps. The spaghetti straps are very familiar to people who wish to finish off slips, gowns, evening wear. Once more, your bias spaghetti can make a frog. And bias as a trim makes a very interesting collar or cuff. We'll now learn how to cut our bias strips. Double fold French piping. But before we go into our piping, we'll learn about joining bias strips. Very often, one needs much more strip or, or length of bias than one can accommodate by cutting. So we will join it. Joining must always take place on the lengthwise grain. In order to join it correctly, one lines up your lengthwise grain. And just joining it and lining it up in this manner, you form a right angle. Automatically, you have one quarter of an inch seam allowance. Wherever the little corner of the underpiece appears, that shows you the amount of seam allowance. Stitch from corner to corner. We stitch off on our little piece of fabric. And we have a continuous piece of bias that reacts as if it were one piece by the amount of stretch. I have here some strips that have been cut with a perpendicular to the edge of the strip, which gives us a bias seam. Bias seams are acceptable in garments or necessary when you join two parts of a skirt or a waist. But a bias seam in a strip will not give the strip the necessary stretch or movement that is required of it. We have it cut on the grain, and you see that you have opposing pulls. Frequently, this will break, and once more, it will not be really invisible, since that's what we call for when we use bias strips. Now, we're going to put 
a continuous piping around the bottom of this sleeve. Continuous piping is not always necessary, but for the purpose of finishing this little area of the sleeve, it would be pretty. And one takes your strip of bias and without really twisting it, it almost seems as if you're twisting it, you line up your lengthwise grain lines on your little strip. And we stitch. To make sure that our bias will work effectively, we must press open the small seam. It's just a tiny seam. Bring the raw edges of the bias together because we are going to make a double fold. It's not always necessary, but we are going to do that. And you crease the center and stretch at the same time. So you will have the effect of a nice round edge, but you must remove some of the stretch from the bias strip. We do that at the iron. I have here a piece that has been stretched and pressed. And you'll notice that it is started out the same size, but it is slightly larger. It is sufficiently large to accommodate the bottom edge of this sleeve. We start by bringing our edges together. Since this is a continuous strip, you can place the seam joining towards the back or underarm of the sleeve. It is not always feasible if you're using a great deal of bias strip. The joining will appear where it will have to appear. We pin the edges together and we baste. You are only going to use a little bit less than one quarter of an inch seam allowance. Therefore, you will, per, you will baste approximately one eighth of an inch away from the raw edge, keeping all your edges together. With our sleeve basted, our bias at the end of the sleeve, we will turn our sleeve so the bias is facing up. This right side of the sleeve is at the inside, and we will stitch. It's always simpler to stitch on the inside of a circumference as opposed to the outside. Using a scant quarter of an inch, we'll stitch around the bottom of this sleeve. Overlap your stitching approximately half an inch and remove the garment from the sewing machine. Clip your threads and trim off, I guess you could call them the little ears of the bias. Remove your basting. Basting must always be removed before one goes on to the next step.
because the next step is going to cover the raw edge of your garment. Using the folded edge of the bias, we bring the bias down over the seam allowance, creasing it into the bias, down to the bottom of the sleeve. Then carefully bring the edge of the fold to the stitching line. If you plan on finishing this by stitching on the machine, you must bring the edge of the fold past the stitching line to enable you to crack stitch. But if you're planning on finishing this by hand, you should permit that row of stitching to be just visible. We're going to hem this to the seam allowance only. You do not hem to the surface of the garment. The stitches should not be visible at all when hand stitching this particular finish. And we hem it. Just short of the machine stitching. The hemmed sleeve where the hem, the stitching is just shy of the machine stitching. And our crack stitch finish, where you can see the stitching on the right side, just underneath the piping. And the wrong side shows you where it has been caught on the machine. French piping can be used in many areas to finish the raw edge of a garment. Bias strip as a surface facing as opposed to an inside facing. This type of bias is put on from the wrong side and turned and finished on the right side. You'll notice the difference in shapes. Straight piece of bias, a curved piece of bias. This is the same as this except the iron has formed this curve. At the ironing board, you stretch the outside edge and you curve the inside edge to enable you to place it around the curve of the neckline. Of course, it is always simpler to apply if you have a larger opening to your neckline as opposed to a narrower neckline opening. We'll start by applying the edge to the edge and carefully pinning perpendicular to the edge to enable you to shape this, turn the edge very carefully, easing slightly as you go along. Now, the easing may look like little bumps, but it's important that you do not form tucks or creases. 
your outer edge may start to fold over as you get to a sharper point or sharper curve in the neckline. But at all times, you must keep the stitching line area smooth. Move around the neckline or armhole or bottom curve of a hemline. This is a type of finish that is used in many, many areas. One not, does not always have to say a neckline finish. A straight piece of fabric would never work in this manner, always using a bias strip. When you finish pinning, basting is very important. Occasionally one can avoid basting, but it's important in many areas where the garment may slip. And you can really control the ease With the pins removed, you can see how the bias has curved up. But that's perfectly all right. We're now going to stitch. A quarter of an inch seam allowance. At no time must puckers appear. If you find a pucker, rip out the stitches and remove, return to your stitching. Never leave a pucker under the stitches. It invariably appears at the center front of the garment. Remove your basting. And we're ready to trim and turn to the right side. Trimming is not always necessary if you've used a small enough seam allowance. But clipping is. And we must clip around the neckline edge closer where the curve is more pronounced and a little further apart where your edges are straight. We forgot a little bit of basting here. Now we'll turn this to the right side. We first will crease the bias over the seam allowance. We'll then turn this to the outside or right side of the garment. And you'll find that you must leave a little more bias to the inside to enable it to roll effectively and at the same time to appear flat. We'll put in a few pins along the edge and then we'll turn under our raw edge on the outside to finish. There's only one way of finishing this, and this is of edge stitching it. We'll turn under our edge, 
making sure that our strip remains constant, that we have the same width overall. And as you turn under your edge, you'll see that the bias facing will lay flat. Now we'll baste. Baste about an eighth of an inch from the edge. We will stitch right along the edge. A method of using your bias strips is to make spaghetti straps. We're going to make spaghetti straps and turn them into loop buttonholes. With a narrow strip of bias, square cut one end and fold it in half right sides together. We'll start stitching at the top edge a little further out than we originally will finish. We'll start stitching a wide end and then narrowing the stitching down. This is almost, you can almost call it a funnel top. It is not easy to see on the sewing machine, but when I finish you'll see. Start at the wider edge and narrow it down. We'll narrow down leaving one press a foot of seam allowance. We can make the spaghetti straps narrower if you wish. It is essential that when you stitch the bias strip that you stretch ever so slightly if you do not stretch while you're stitching, your threads will snap when you are in the process of turning this strip to the right side. Don't skimp on your stitching. And don't be upset when it looks as if the tension of the machine is wrong. What you have done was stretch and that caused that slight looping. And this is the funnel effect I was talking about. We now are going to use a new tool, a loop turner. It's got a small lock at the end, and it's rather long. That will enable you to slide the spaghetti or bias tubing onto the loop turner, catch it in that little latch at the top, and by pulling, creating tension, you'll be able to turn it inside out. It is advisable that you take the loop turner and hook it on something so you can create a good amount of tension and lightly guide the fabric over the starting latch. If you have a great deal a fabric to turn where the latch may open up, it's a good idea to take a tiny bit of scotch tape and lock the loop, the latch in place. 
then keeping this with some tension, slide the fabric onto itself, hoping that you won't loosen up on that latch. And here we are. We came out with the latch intact and your spaghetti is turning to the right side or actually your bias tubing. And here we are. If you use this for shoulder straps, it's important that you get as much stretch out of this as possible because you would not want to put it on a garment and then have the strap stretch and the garment would not fit. So make sure you get rid of your stretch. At the same time, you'll notice that I haven't snapped any stitches. That's because I stretched it as I stitched. Now, we're ready to make spaghetti or loop buttonholes. We have the front of our garment prepared with our facing ready with the stitching, the edge stitched of our facing and our interfacing in place. To enable you to make your buttonholes effectively, it is helpful to make some kind of a grid on paper. The grid would be the width of the buttonhole and the depth of the buttonhole. So when we start placing the spaghetti or, to the, or the bias tubing to the paper and stitching it in place, because we'll stitch directly over the paper, the buttonhole will be formed. Adjust your machine so you have a large stitch. If you do not, you're going to find that your machine, your paper may rip. And again, you do not want to use too heavy paper because you'll find that you will not be able to remove your paper. Stitch the loops on the paper using a tr thread trimmer to guide the loops. Care should be taken that the edge of the seam should be turned towards the inside of the loop. It takes time, but it's worth it. One stitch at a time until you've made the desired amount of loops. Do not concern yourself with what is happening to the right side of your loops in this area because that will be trimmed off after we finish attaching it to the garment. When you finish stitching it, gently remove the paper from the sewing machine because you do not want to rip the paper. Return the sewing machine to the correct stitch size while you're thinking of it. Otherwise, you will find yourself using too large a stitch. <laughs> 
We now will turn the garment to the right side and we will place the loops. Now this is my loop. This is the loop and the loop will be facing in towards the garment. Line up the paper. I'm cutting away a little bit of my excess paper. Line up this stitching line along the stitching line of your garment, placing the loops exactly where you want them to go. We will pin the paper down in the exact spot that you intend your loops to finalize. And once more, we'll stitch the loops into place. But this time we're stitching the loops to the front of the garment or wherever you want your loops to go. Put a row of stitching, one row over from the original row of stitching. Remove the garment from the sewing machine and clip your threads. Now, let's remove the paper. As you see, the loops have been stitched down. Fold or crease the paper right along the stitching line and that will help you remove the paper. We want our loops to look like this. So, we take our facing and place the facing right sides together and pin, securing the facing to the front of the garment. If you're putting a collar on, you'd put a collar on. If you were at this point, you would join this part of the garment to the rest of the garment putting in your sleeves, etc., joining your shoulder seams. And we'll baste. You baste from the wrong side, so you'll see where your seam allowance is that has been indicated by the stitching line of the loops to the garment. With our garment basted, we'll stitch, attaching the facing to the garment and finishing our loops. When we come to the loop area, stitch once more one thread over from your original stitching. You do not want any stitching showing on the right side of the garment. And now we'll trim. Of course, we must remove our basting first. And then we trim. And in the trimming, you'll trim down the front of the garment, the desired amount. And while we're trimming, we will trim away the excess loops.
a little bumpy when you trim them, but nothing will happen to them. Add a little bit of thread left here. Move. Trim around the neckline. And clip. And we'll turn it to the right side. Any extra threads that are visible should be clipped away. And frequently you may have some. Of course this has to be pressed. And that would finalize everything beautifully. But we'll see what we can do with finger pressing. And now you can see what bias loops look like. To insert a small amount of bias between layers of cloth, we use cording with the bias wrapped around that cord. The width and the dimensions of the cording may vary to the style or the garment you wish to include it. You lay your cord to the wrong side of your bias strip. Bring the raw edges together and using the cording foot, bring the cording foot against the cord and stitch. That will wrap your cording or your bias strip around the cord. We will put our layer of cording between an upper and under collar. Cording may be used in many areas. Waistlines, around lapels, between a cuff and a sleeve. It's, this is just one of the ways we are going to use it today. The cording foot enables you to get very, very close to the cord. So when you finish, you have a very tight presentation. We have here our collar, an interfaced upper collar and an under collar. With the right side of the collar up, place your cording to the edge of the garment, to the edge of the seam allowance. And bring it right around the edge, pinning it carefully. All your edges should be even. Do not stretch and easing is not necessary. This is also an ideal finish around the neckline of a plain garment, of a jewel neck garment. A little bit of cording will finish that neckline. Again, it is inserted between the garment and the, and the facing. With the, gar with the cording pinned in position or entirely around the collar, will baste. 
you baste as close to the stitch as you can, but not on the stitch. We will stitch the basted cording to the upper collar. When you stitch this time, push the press of foot over very slightly so you will be stitching directly over or to one side of your original row of stitching. We can go a little faster because you're not worried about your curve at this point, your cording is guiding the press of foot. Remove the basting. And we're going to get ready to join the upper collar and the under collar. In the industry, this procedure is done in one operation. The machine has a special foot that will control the operation. Most sample rooms have to follow this procedure. Bring upper collar and under collar together once more because the under collar is smaller than the upper collar. We must stretch it slightly. Bring all your edges together. And baste. With the collar basted, we're ready to stitch. We will stitch with the upper collar up so you can see the stitching where the collar and the facing were attached. Following the stitching line, stitch very close again the cording foot permits you to ride a lot faster and not worry about corners on your curved edge. Clip your threads and remove the basting. Trimming is very important and if you trim close enough, you will not have to clip or wedge out bits of fabric. 
course care always should be taken that you don't trim so closely that your stitches are interfered with. Turn it to the right side. and finger press. And with your cording in place, you have a very neat trim along the edge of a collar, neckline, between a waist and a skirt for a waistline finish. Cording 